and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we're joined by Dr. Natalie Hinkle, planetary astrophysicist at the Southwest Research Institute. We'll talk about her work showing how we might look for phosphorus around other stars in the search for extraterrestrial life. We'll also talk about the discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus and what that means in the search for life on other worlds. We're also going to learn about a new study showing how much of the gold in the universe was formed, and we take an in-depth look at how phosphorus in the space around stars might help astronomers find life on planets in nearby solar systems. The discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus has researchers questioning whether life might exist on our planetary neighbor. Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system. Atmospheric pressure on its surface is 90 times that on Earth and the planet is also subject to sulfuric acid rain. However, conditions 50 kilometers or about 30 miles above the surface of that world are much more Earth-like. On our home world, phosphine is almost always produced by the breakdown of biological organisms. However, it is produced by chemical means in the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn. Researchers who made this discovery determined that no known chemical reaction could form the amount of phosphine seen in the atmosphere of Venus, suggesting a biological origin. Confirmation of the discovery, however, may need to wait for future spacecraft visiting our neighboring planet. Astrophysicists have been unable to explain the quantities of gold seen around the universe. Most heavy elements are formed in the interiors of massive stars or from the collision of ultra-dense neutron stars. A new study shows supernova explosions of massive stars with powerful magnetic fields could produce the excess gold seen by astronomers. Next week, we're going to be joined by a pair of scientists involved in this discovery. The presence of phosphorus in distant star systems could make worlds in these systems more likely to have developed life, new study finds. By examining light coming from stars, astronomers may be able to pinpoint planets most likely to have developed life. Phosphorus is the rarest of six elements needed for biological reactions here on Earth. This week, we are joined by Dr. Natalie Hinkle, one of the researchers who led this fascinating discovery. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we are happy to welcome Dr. Natalie Hinkle to the show. Uh, she is a planetary astrophysicist with Southwest Research Institute and recently did some interesting work showing how phosphorus can be used to find planets friendly to life around the cosmos. Welcome to the show, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Great. So um, can you do, help, uh, help us learn a little, little bit about how this, what, what is phosphorus and how does it help us find planets that may be friendly to life? Sure. So phosphorus is uh, element 15 in the periodic table, and it is incredibly important for life on Earth. Um, it's part of our DNA and our RNA. It's actually even like a major component of, of our planet. So uh, what, what my, my colleagues and I realized, uh, so specifically one colleague in particular, Dr. Hilary Hartnett, she's an oceanographer. And um, she and I were talking 
about sort of different elements that may, may or may not help us and uh, when we're searching for, for planets that may or may not be habitable. And she's like, oh, well, what does is, what is phosphorus look like in stars? And I was like, I don't know, why is, why is phosphorus even important? <laughs> so she had to explain it to me. And, um, and then we realized that uh, we don't actually know a ton about phosphorus in stars in general. But, um, but we wanted to still sort of understand like what it is that we do know thus far. And so we decided to try to understand what, do phosphorus, what does phosphorus look like in stars? What does it look like in our own planet? And how does it compare to even uh, planets in our solar system? And this is super important because um, so stars and planets are made at the, at the same time. And they're made out of the same material. So it's all one big gas of dust and, and gas. Yeah, big ball of gas. And it eventually collapses down and it forms a star. And at the same time that the star is formed, you also get a planet. So they're made at, at the same, like from the same epoch of time, the same stuff. But um, the problem is, is that when we're trying to find planets that may be habitable, we want to understand what's going on inside of these planets. Like, uh, the, the interior of, of the earth is super important. Uh, we need to know if like there's tectonics, if there's volcanology, or sorry, volcanoes, um, and because we need the, the planets to be active and you know, geochemically active, have these different cycles moving elements around. Um, but we don't currently have the technology to, to measure whether, what like, the composition of a planet. Like we can't see its surface and we definitely can't see its interior. So we use what's in the star to understand what's in the planet. Um, but at least when it comes to the earth, most of phosphorus actually goes into our core. Um, and so we wanted to see that like what kind of variations might, might exist in stars uh, in terms of their phosphorus content. Do they have like something similar to the sun? Do they have something different? And, and sort of try to understand what that might mean for what would be available for, for planet formation. Hmm. And does this, is this phosphorus, um, these phosphorus deposits evenly distributed throughout a solar system as it's forming? That's a or great question. Yeah, no, um, actually it's not. Um, when you form planets, it's, it's actually a really complicated process um, because you have not you have a lot going on. So you have uh, you have the star, and as um, when everything's sort of still being formed, you have the planetary disk. So this is the the layer in which the planets are being formed. Um, you have a lot of different impacts of just the general physics that's going on. You have the winds coming off of the star. Um, you also have just the straight radiation, the heat that's coming off the star. So that means that after it, so any planets that are kind of near to the star, they're going to be warmer, hotter. Etc. But so are the elements that go into them. So um, in general, we find that uh, planets that are much bigger uh, tend to form further out from the star because you can have um, these uh, elements that might have uh, uh, sort of burned up or been too volatile close to the star, but further away, they freeze and they become ices. And so it's easy to co condense down into big planets. But then as you get closer, you don't have some of these elements. So yeah, so depending on where the planet forms in, in the disk, that'll definitely impact where different elements go, um, including phosphorus. But at this point, we generally tend to assume that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the star and the planet. So what's in the star is what we see in the planet. Now, this isn't perfect and it's definitely an assumption, but we're this is a very new field. Um, I'm probably one of like five or seven people in the world who look at going from the composition of the star to the makeup of the planet. And so we're still working on trying to get these models to see like, oh, well, what if you do have different planets forming in different places? And what if they're different sizes? And, and what would that mean for how these, these different elements in the disk might fractionate or, or separate into different clumps? So yeah, we're still, still working on that part of it. But Right now, I think it's a it's a decent assumption to say that's what's in the star is is in the planet. Yeah, that's interesting. I think especially for people who are new to astronomy or who look at it um, on a more superficial, you know, surface level, that um, you know we look at stars, typical you know main sequence stars like our sun, or you know, to paraphrase the crystal entity, big bags of mostly hydrogen. <laughs> uh, but you know we see in our own solar system you know rocky planets 
um, on the inner part of our solar system. And so how does, in, in, but when we look at the exoplanets, we're seeing a lot of different unexpected um, planetary systems that are very different from what we see here. So can you talk a little bit about how material is is distributed in different solar systems like that? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so we've seen some pretty crazy stuff, actually, things that we weren't anticipating, especially because this field is only like 25 years old. So it's been um, pretty like mind-boggling how, how very different different planetary systems can be from our own solar system. So, um, so you have some uh, planetary systems where instead of having the, the huge you know, gas giant planets further out, they're really close to their star. Uh, we call these hot Jupiters because a lot of them are about the size of our Jupiter, but they're, they orbit like, you know, days around their stars <laughs> instead of like, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and uh, so what we sort of think of that with that is that we know that these gas giant planets had to form further out. So they probably migrated in over time and likely sort of swept up and like ate the smaller planets that were probably in their way, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, and so we also have, uh, we've seen a bunch of planets that don't actually mirror anything that we have in our solar system. Um, they're sort of between Earth-sized planets and like Neptune-sized planets. So some of these we call super Earths and mini Neptunes are very, very clever when it comes to our naming schemes. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and a lot of times we're actually like not exactly sure how they could form or what uh, what their interiors might look like. Um, so like if a if a planet is like you know a couple times bigger than the Earth, is it is it going to still uh, be rocky or might it be start becoming more gaseous? Uh, so it's it's kind of up in the air what those kind of systems might be and and how exactly they could form because most of our models to date are really just based on the solar system. So anything new or like cool. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, let's see how this could, you know, it's, it's, it's more theoretical than anything, but like any good theory, you try to trace it back to what could actually happen, like based on the observations that we see. Um, then we see some other sort of crazy things like um, uh, planets that are in very, very eccentric orbits. So Earth's orbit is like almost a perfect circle. So if this has eccentric, uh, an eccentricity of zero, we see some, if this is one, if it's a perfect line is one, we see some that are like at 0.93 or something. It's, it's nuts. So it's, it's like this uh, little planet comes swooping by and like for like a very tiny period of time is next to the star. It gets like blasted with the, the radiation, the heat. And then it spends most of its time like way far away from the star and which is nuts. Um, we've seen planets that orbit two stars at the same time um, or just one star of a pair. Uh, so that's kind of nuts. So, um, so yeah, so we think that especially for some of those weirder systems that there might've been some kind of event that happened, especially to knock that really highly eccentric planet. Um, so, you know, maybe um, a giant planet came in and tried to eat it and didn't work out and sort of knocked it into this weird orbit. So yeah, so there's actually a lot of the cool things to try to try to play with and see what could, um, you know, physically exist. All right, All right. That's fabulous. The idea of a planet-sized comet, essentially, right? <laughs> is, is just, just nuts. I also think there's an episode of Enterprise about that. I'm sure uh, there, is. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a great episode of uh, Community, and Troy asked LeVar Burton, he's like, why is it called Star Trek? You rarely go to stars, you mostly go to planets. And I'm like, ooh, it's kind of true. <laughs> uh, it's great. So can you tell us a little bit about um, why phosphorus is so difficult to find sure, around yeah. planets, and how the heck do you intend to find it? Uh, yeah, that's actually the thing I've been working on for a while now. So, all right, we see with our eyeballs, uh, we call it the optical band. So it's between about 400 and 700 nanometers. So this is in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, that's great. And that's actually like what we've, we've centered a lot of our telescopes on is that we try to look in the optical and see stars and measure them, things like that. The problem is, is that um, when you're looking for phosphorus, so what this, we, we look in um, the, the photospheres of stars, is that 
phosphorus, uh, when it absorbs light, it does it at very specific wavelengths. This is true for, for all, all atoms. But uh, where phosphorus does it is at the edge of the optical regime. And uh, so it's right, it lies right between the optical and the near infrared. So, it, so its line is about at a thousand nanometers. So that's where it likes to absorb the light. Um, the problem is that there's not a lot of instruments that hit exactly uh, 1,000 nanometers. Um, so, so we're lying in between, like in the sort of like instrumentational dead spot. On top of that, um, when you move past the optical and into the infrared and, and you're on the earth, it, it's actually really difficult to get observations you know, the, the atmosphere is made mostly of water. And so um, when you're looking in the, in the infrared, the, the water in the atmosphere actually blocks a lot of the light that we can see. So it's, it's even harder than to get this line that's at about a thousand nanometers. Like I said, it's like right on the edge. And so uh, we get a lot of interference from, from the atmosphere. So um, I've been working on, uh, and talking to people about phosphorus for a, a number of years now. So we realized that we essentially need to develop new technology and, and new telescopes in order to just to try to measure phosphorus. So, um, so I'm working with a team at Arizona State right now. Um, Arizona State is where I went to graduate school. Mm. And we're actually going to um, uh, propose to NASA uh, to get <laughs> to ask them for money so we can build a CubeSat. So this is a small right. satellite where we can specifically measure phosphorus above the Earth's atmosphere in Earth's orbit at from, you know, about 900 to about I think 1200 nanometers. So exactly focusing on phosphorus to try to get more of these, these measurements because they're, it is just that hard, but it's also that important. Wow. And as I understand, only about 1% of stars have, have had their um, phosphorus contents measured. Exactly. So you think, and how much of that do you think is a lack of phosphorus around the stars and how much is just a lack of not being able to find them yet? It's definitely just uh, an issue with the technology. Um, very few people will go have gone specifically after phosphorus um, and so it's not that people have tried and they just didn't see anything because even that um, would be reported and you just say like oh there's there's very 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 little <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but it but it's just that it's that difficult that you have to have specific studies by teams of people who spend a long time just trying to to get these observations and so that's and that's a lot just because of trying to deal with the atmosphere and and find get the the right um the, enough time on telescopes to really observe these lines well so it's just it's just a difficult prog problem but that's why we're trying to to get different kinds of technology to make it easier for us so we've been also encouraging other colleagues because uh you know i don't want to be the phosphorus queen i'd rather get help in this and and ask for you know just ask people to get me as much phosphorus data as they can that's great and speaking of getting a whole lot of data you put together um what's called the hypatia catalog can you tell us a little bit about that and, sure, yeah. and how you came about to, came about doing that um, so I've actually been working on the Hypatia catalog for about 10 years now. Um, it was the, the core project for my PhD. And um, so what I did uh, very painfully, uh, put together uh, hundreds of data sets of elements measured in stars, what we call these elemental abundances. And I wrote a database in order to handle all of this data because so in astronomy, most data sets are sort of sort of two-dimensional. You look at a bunch of stars and then you measure a bunch of things in them. But uh, when I was putting together all of this data, it ends up being multi-dimensional because I have stars and different elements measured by different groups. And some of these stars have planets. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like this huge, like, you know, programmatic undertaking. I didn't, I didn't code very well, um, but, uh, but I had to learn how to. And so I put all of this data together and um, realized that it was just me sitting on all of this. Um, at, when it first uh, got it up and running, it had about, I think, 3,000 stars and I had 200,000 individual element measurements. 
Um, but since that time, I continue maintaining the database. Uh, it's now up to about 10,000 stars, uh, 400,000 element abundances, 77 elements, and 1,300 planet hosting stars. And so all of this is online now at hypatiacatalog.com so that I'm not just the only one who's looking at this. Um, there's so much data there. And uh, yeah, I wanted people to be able to, to use it and access it. But it's been like, you know, my, my baby since forever. Um, in fact, when, um, when I, I defended my PhD, I, I took a copy of, of my dissertation and I wrapped it in a pink blanket and presented it to my parents. <laughs> that's great yeah so you know it's been a it's been a labor of love but it's a, definitely something i'm proud of it's the backbone of, of all of my work and it's something that i'm very happy to to share with people that's great and finally um with all this research you've done and all the data you've collected um what sort of worlds would you want us to look at in an attempt to find life? Where are we most likely to find it? So it's a, it's a great question, but honestly, I'm, I'm kind of torn um, and the answer to it because like just the, the obvious thing to me is like, oh, well, let's look around stars that are going to be like our own sun because we know that we exist, but that's basing everything on, on a single data point, which is hard to do. Um, so more recently, I've actually been looking at trying to find planets or characterizing planets around um, M dwarf stars. So these are much cooler, much dimmer stars compared to our sun, but there's so many more of them. Um, in fact, it's the most prevalent star in the universe. There's, they make up 76% of all stars. Um, but M dwarfs are a little wonky. They're, since they're small and cold, it means that the planets have to be really close uh, to, mm. to be warm, you know, uh, in the habitable zone. Uh, but also uh, M dwarfs can be fairly active, so they have stellar flares. And if you're close and they're flaring, that's not a great combination. Um, so I'm not sure. I think there's a lot of cool places to look. At, and, and honestly, I think it's it makes sense to look um, in as many sort of rocky planets as we can. And, and in, in this, I also include, you know, planets that might be like Mercury, which are like, you know, fairly small, but also maybe up to the super Earths, I think that makes sense to, to see the, you know, what could be out there in a variety of settings. Um, I don't extend that quite so far to like gas giant planets. Cause I feel like that's just, that's just way too hard. <laughs> but, uh, but when it comes to like rocky planets, we have a better sense of what's going on. So essentially any and all rocky planets, I think that's a great place to try, try to find life or, or try to find a planet where that it might be habitable for, for humans. Um, I usually refer, say the word habitability and mean it both ways. It's either inhabited or could be habited by us at some point. So I think some, given we have one data point, they're kind of interchangeable. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Natalie. That was, that was fabulous talking with you. Thank you for having me. And I did want to point out, I'm actually wearing a little bit of phosphorus right now. This uh, is a necklace made of appetite. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, I, I got one for, for me and my collaborator, Hillary, to, um, to celebrate our get, guests getting our paper done. <laughs> That's great. Congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And that was Dr. Natalie Hinkle, planetary astrophysicist at Southwest Research Institute. Next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we have a very special global episode planned. We'll be talking with Dr. Amanda Karakis of Monash University, speaking from Melbourne, Australia, as well as Dr. Shiaki Kobayashi from the University of Hertfordshire, joining us from London. These researchers were at the heart of a new study showing how much of the gold in the universe was produced by a particular type of supernova explosion. Make sure to tune in through video or podcast starting on September 29th. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news and education together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and 
viewers around the world. We depend on support from viewers like you. To help support this program with a one-time donation or a paid subscription starting at just 99 cents a month, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.